I want to say good morning to everyone, and the audio and video quality is going to be off this morning because I forgot my camera. We just got back from Florida for my grandmother's funeral, and we're still recovering from that, so you're going to have to forgive me for getting my camera bag. But uh, this morning, we're going to be in part three of Leviticus 19. This is the last part of the sermon on what it means to be holy. The last part of what it means to be holy. For Leviticus 19, part 3. Um, we're going to jump right into the text. If you want to follow along, you can open your Bibles to this uh, particular passage. Uh, starting in verse 19, it says, You will keep my statutes. You will not let your cattle engender with a diverse kind. You will not sow your field with two kinds of seed, neither will there come upon you a garment of two kinds of stuff mingled together. This is one of those passages people of the world love to try to go to to say that Christians are not following the law of God today. And they try to make out his law to be something ridiculous. When someone is like, like oh, we need to follow God's law, we need to follow God's law, and then someone of the world will retort, well, you see, you're not supposed to have two different things, two different types of garments mingled. And yet you do that. And they try to use that to try to excuse that their own sin. Well, I have bad news for a lot of folks out there. One per someone else's bad behavior doesn't excuse your own, number one. But then number two. There's a lot of people out there that are that claim to be following God's law that are not following God's law. And then there's a lot of people that are not following his law that claim to be following his law, but they're mistaken about his law. See, that we are under the New Testament today, not under the old. And the prince and they told and they're caught up in this whole thing of mingling two garments or mixing cattle. And the thing is, they're missing the point. The point that is trying to be driven home to the Israelites, and the point that so many people miss today, that was being taught back then, in a physical sense, is the principle of separation. If we are going to be holy, we have to be a separate people. We have to be a discriminatory people. Discrimination is, in, for, our, for all intents and purposes, in this culture, in our country today, is considered a bad word. It's considered a dirty word. And yet discrimination is not a dirty word. Did you know that when you go to a restaurant and you say, well, I want this particular sandwich and not this other particular sandwich, because you don't prefer the taste of the other particular sandwich, you are being discriminatory. You have discriminating tastes. We are to be a discriminatory people. And not in the sense that we, not in the sense of racism. By all means, the Bible says that God has made of all nations one blood. He's made us all of one blood. Whether you are a black man, a white man, or any shade in between, you are still made in the image of God. You still have a soul that is precious. We don't need to be discriminatory based off the color of skin, but we do need to be discriminatory. And we're going to notice how that we need to be discriminatory this morning. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, it says, Do not become unequally yoked with unbelieving ones. For what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? And what fellowship has light with darkness? What agreement has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with unbelieving ones? And what alliance has a temple of God with idols? For you are a temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will be dwelling among them and will be walking among them. And I will be their God and they will be a people to me. Hence, come out from the midst of them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and I will accept you. 
and will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. We are. To, I want to notice one thing real quick before continuing on. The you, when it says you are a temple of the living God, that is plural. That's not. That's not saying that each one of us is a temple. It's saying you, plural. He's talking to the people of God. We are the temple of God. Christians are the temple of God. We are the household of God. And we're told to come out from the midst of them and be separate. Who, who is this them? It's talking about the unbelieving one. I have a brother in Christ by the name of John Shannon. Great gospel preacher. He's one of the men who inspired me to become a preacher. And I tell you, if he was to walk into this building this morning, he would be just as invited to worship with us. He'd be invited to get up and speak just as much as me. Because we are to be like God and that we're supposed to be colorblind. But I don't care what color you are. If you are part of the unbelieving ones, we want you to come in and sit down and learn about the truth, learn about God's people, learn about the kingdom. We want you to become a Christian. You're invited to come in and sit. But do not think for a minute we're going to ask you to get up and teach a class, you know, lead, lead over us in worship, lead in singing or anything like that. There are boundaries. Then Ephesians 5, 6 through 13 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become joint partakers with them, for you were previously in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, testing what is well pleasing to the Lord, and having no fellowship and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but also rather reprove them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things happening by them covertly, but being reproved all things are manifested by the light. For everything which is manifested is light. Um, so we have here have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Do not become joint partakers with them. We are to have no fellowship with the world. And I love the definition given right at the passage of fellowship of joint partakers. We don't co-participate in things with the world. We're not joint partakers with them in spiritual matters. Spiritually speaking, they don't have a place at the table. They don't get to make decisions for the, for the congregation or for the church. They don't get to teach classes. This doesn't mean that we have no interaction with them at all. The principle of it is, is being described as living in the world, but not being of the world. There was a, and some people say, well, what about good things? There was this, uh, back when Tennessee was going, was looking at trying to pass the lottery, there was several groups out there, several denominations that were like, we're going to join together and we're going to oppose the lottery. And that was a good thing that they did. But I could not join in with them. I could not stand there and hold in one hand a Baptist and another hand a Methodist. And say that we as Christians oppose the lottery. Because they are not Christians. They are not Christians because they have not been redeemed. They have not been properly converted. Now they could try to argue that they're Christians all that they want to. But if you want to go back and look at what it means to become a Christian, you need to go back and study the book of Acts. That's a book of conversions. Look at what people did in the book of Acts to become Christians. If we are going to be holy, we must be separate from the world. Then verse 20, Leviticus 19, Whoever lies carnally with a woman who is a bondmaid betrothed to a husband and not at all redeemed, nor freedom given her, they will be punished. They will not be put to death because she was not free. And he will bring his trespass offering to Jehovah, to the, excuse me, to the door of the tent of meeting, even a ram for a trespass offering. And the priest will make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering before Jehovah for his sin, 
which he has sinned. And the sin which he has sinned will be forgiven him. Now this is one of those sections that's somewhat difficult to get the point on if one is, does not pay close attention to detail. There's a difference legally between a free woman back then and a bond woman or a slave. A free woman could reject a man's advances if he was not her husband. A slave had to obey their master. Now let's not get this twisted. God never intended for anyone, whether they be a slave or free under the Old Testament, to be mistreated and to be put in a position where they had to sin. But, a man, but man has a way of twisting God's word. He has a way of trying to pervert God's law to use it against God's law. So in his wisdom, God put in a provision in this point that this particular sin wasn't punishable by death, but the sinners were not let off the hook. They were to be punished. Now this is all background information to the point. The point of this passage is that if one wants to be holy, if one seeks to be holy, he has to accept the consequences and take responsibility for his sin. That means that if one repents, then he needs to ask for forgiveness. He needs to make restitution if, if possible. Too many times people want to say that they're sorry and not face the consequences of their decisions. And sometimes you can be let off the hook from your consequences. But then sometimes you have to face the consequences. There's one uh, man a, a while back, notorious serial killer. His name was uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, if I remember correctly. Horrendous serial killer. Go look him up. If I remember, and I believe that is the, I'm talking about the right one here. Uh, if I'm mistaken, someone can let me know outside and I can try to fix it in, in notes on the video. But um, if I remember correctly, Jeffrey Dahmer, he was this notorious serial killer. And, in, and when he was in prison, he was convicted. When he was in prison, he learned the truth. He repented of his sins. He was immersed into Christ. He became a Christian. He turned his life around. He was trying to convert other people while he was in prison. and They wound up killing him. Um, but the thing is, he became a Christian, and yet he st even though his sins, all those murders that he committed had been forgiven, he still had to stay in prison because he had to face the consequences of his sins. If you play the lottery, we mentioned the lottery, if you play the lottery and you go into debt and you're in the poor house, if you repent and become a Christian, all so things are not just magically better for you in the physical realm. You have to face the consequences of your sin. And then even those who are Christians, when we sin, we have to face consequences. We have to take responsibility for our actions. Verse 23. And when you will come into the land and will have all planted. Uh, excuse me. And when you. Uh, excuse me. And when you will come into the land and will have planted all manner of trees for food. Then you will count the fruit of it as their uncircumcision. Three years they will be as uncircumcised to you. It will not be eaten. But in the fourth year, all the fruit of it will be holy for giving praise to Jehovah. And in the fifth year, you will eat of the fruit of it and that it may yield to you the increase of it. I am Jehovah your God. We find here again the principle of separation. The fruit of the land for the first three years was to be considered unclean uncircumcised if you will and not eaten the fourth year it was given to God and then the fifth year they were able to eat the principle here is that we don't give to God nor do we ingest that which is unclean 
Now, before the seventh day Adventists all start saying, "That's right, we need to avoid unclean meats like swine." I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about bacon. <laughs> I'm not talking about catfish. I'm not talking about shrimp. Remember, the Old Testament was physical in nature. The New Testament is spiritual. We know from the New Testament in Romans 12, 1 and 2 that our worship is to be pure when offered to God, not conformed to the world's standards. And we also have warnings to avoid false teachers and not put junk food in our spiritual diets. I'm going to ask a rhetorical question for you this morning. I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. Nobody need answer out loud. I'm not, going to, I'm not asking for an out loud I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. I want you to answer within yourself. Why do we avoid teachings from the Book of Mormon? Why do we not use the Quran? Oh, we need to study these things to understand the arguments and know how to refute, refute them. But we don't ingest these things as spiritual truth. We don't teach and practice what they do. There is something subtle that we need to be aware of as well. And, and the reason why we don't read those things, why we don't ingest those things as spiritual truth, and why we don't teach those principles, is because that they are spiritual junk food. Worse, they are spiritual poison. There is something subtle we need to be aware of um, that we're about to get to in a minute. But it has been said before that a lie mixed in with the truth is much like rat poison. It has 99% good food, but 1% poison. And it is the 1% poison that kills the rat. It's the 1% poison that kills you. And I'm gonna be honest with you. It's a little bit nerve. I'm a little bit nervous to talk what I'm about to talk about because I'm gonna be stepping on some shoes this morning, stepping on some toes, and I'm gonna be talking about a, uh, one of the sacred cows, one of the golden calves that people jump around and dance around today, both in the denominational world and within congregations of the churches of Christ. We need to be very careful about the translations that we use. We have to make sure that the translations that we use are accurate or else we are putting spiritual poison into our spiritual food. And in studying, and I've revised this a little bit, I found a litmus test that one can use to see if the Bible that they're using is okay or whether they need to put it away and get something different. First off, like I said, and I've tailored this, I've altered this. First, does your Bible contain the Apocrypha? There is a Bible that has the Apocrypha in it called the, the New American Bible and it's a Catholic Bible. It has the Apocrypha in it, like First and Second Maccabees. Now, there is a whole study that could be done about the Apocrypha. There have been whole studies done about the Apocrypha. That will show how the Apocryphal books are uninspired, should not be in the, in the Bible. If your Bible has the Apocrypha in it, you close that thing up and you put it away. Don't use it. Spiritual poison. Second, is your Bible a study Bible? And if so, are the helps historical, archaeological, customary in nature? Do they explain life in Bible times? Do they give definitions and names? Do they, they tell when a book was written? I have a, an American Standard Version of 1901. It has an archaeological section in the back. And it tells about how that we know about the walls of Jericho falling. It, it has about um, 
has about like King David in it. All these archaeological helps. And that's fine. If you have a study Bible like that, that's fine. But if your study Bible starts trying to explain verses, like I have one that tries to say, that tries to explain away Acts 2.38 and say that there are people who twist it. They say that one has to be baptized for the remission of sins. Yeah, I have a study Bible that tries to say that we don't have to do that. They try to explain away Acts 2.38. I don't use that study Bible. If you have a study Bible that's telling you what verses mean, rather than giving you outside background information, you need to take that thing and you need to shelve it. I didn't say shove it, I said shelve it. Put it on the shelf, don't use it. Now this, by default, eliminates Bibles like one that I have right here. This is one I picked up from a thrift store called the New Testament Recovery Version. It's put out by Living Streams Ministry. When we get to talking about Witness Lee and Witness Knee or whatever, or Chairman Knee, whatever, uh, it, I, I can't remember exactly who puts the, uh, their names. But they're part of the uh, the local church movement, is what it's called. Uh, when we get to the, to talking about that in our denominational studies Sunday morning, y'all know more about it. But um, this this New Testament, it's full of footnotes. It's full of footnotes. Some pages are one quarter Bible. Now, I mean, actually, the actual translation text, it's, I'm not very, I, I don't really recommend it, <clears throat> but like one third, one fourth of the page will be Bible, three quarters of it will be their footnotes, explaining verses. So this one, get rid of it. Don't use it. If your Bible anywhere on it says the NWT, New World Translation, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, anywhere on it or in it, you take that thing and you put it away. You shelve it. You get rid of it. In fact, if you in all these bad Bible translations, if you want to donate them to, to me, I'll give you my address. And you can donate it to me, and I'll take that thing, I'll put it in a cardboard crate, and it will be locked in a secure facility where top men will keep it right next to the Ark of the Covenant. And if you get the Indiana Jones reference, good for you. But the New World Translation, that it's heresy. They, try to act, they actively try to remove the deity of Christ in this version. To the point that they added the word other in Colossians 1.16 and following several times. To make the second person of the Godhead into a created being rather than the creator. In their 1984 revision, they were kind enough to put other in brackets to let you know that the words were supplied. But in the 2013 version, their latest version, they removed the brackets and the word other is slapped in there. That he created all other things. No brackets, no italics, no way to know whether it was in the text or not. Folks, they're trying to tamper with the Word of God, and that needs to be known. Next, look in your Bible and see if the words are in italic. Now, many folks today, they love putting things in italic to stress the importance of what that they're saying. But that's not the case in the Bible. If you're looking in a Bible, and um, if, if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and open it, and you can look at, uh, for example, in John 8.24. John 8.24. Uh, it says uh, to the effect, uh, uh, if you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sin, says that in the King James Version. The word he there is in italics. It's a supplied word. What the, the Greek actually reads where Jesus said that unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. He is talking about him being the second person of the Godhead. He is claiming to be the I am. 
Well, the thing is, the word he is supplied. If, if your Bible doesn't have italics in it, then that's a paraphrase. You need to shelve that thing. You need to stop using it because you don't know what's been supplied and what hasn't been supplied. Like I said, if your Bible doesn't have it, stop using it. And it, by the way, you want if you want a small list, this is just a small list of the Bibles that is eliminate that are eliminated by just not using ones with the uh, with the italics. If you're going to stop using ones without italics, then you've got to put away the RSV, the Holman Christian Standard HCSB. The Christian Standard, the CSB, which is a revision of HCSB, the NIV from 1984, the NIV from 2011, the NLT, the Living Bible Paraphrase, that's LBP, the CEV, Contemporary English Version, the NIRV, which is a different version of the NIV, the NCV, the New Century Version, and the TEV, Today's English Version, the GWT, God's Word Translation, that was endorsed by Billy Graham, and there's a lot more, but that is a small list. So this one, today's English version, gone. NIV, gone. Holy Christian Standard, gone. And then the one that's going to get me in trouble, the ESV. So popular today, even amongst a lot of people that's supposed to be in the, church, in the churches of Christ. The ESV, no italics. Check it out. Get rid of it. If you're wondering what this leaves us with, as far as translations go, it leaves us with the MLV, the American Standard of 1901, the New King James, the King James, and the NASB, or the New American Standard Bible. But before you breathe a sigh, and the thing is, if you use any of those, you can get to the truth, but you have to dig a whole lot uh, on a lot of them. But before you breathe a sigh of relief, let's fine tune this thing down even more, shall we? So that Because we don't want any poison in our food. If we get out and if we, if we release in enough time, if we dismiss in enough time, we like to go to Country Cafe down the road to get vegetable plates sometimes after worship service. Now, I know you can't say anything, but you can, you can shake your head yes or no. Mom, do you, wouldn't you love it if they had meatloaf? How would you like it if they put some poison in your meatloaf? You wouldn't like that very much, would you? Well, that's the thing. We want to remove as much poison as possible from our translations. So let's refine this thing down even more. You have what I call major verses and minor verses. Actually, it's a bad thing. Major flaws and minor flaws. Now, we don't have to worry too much about Romans 10.10. 10. I checked it out in all these versions, that, uh, and, and it's pretty good in all the remaining ones. The, one, the worst offenders of mistranslating and putting the sinner's prayer into Romans 10, 9 and 10, they are done away with already by just getting rid of the ones that don't use italics. The non-italic paraphrases. But Matthew 19, 9, 1 Corinthians 5, 11, any time that you read the word fornication, if it says fornication, you got it. If it reads sexual immorality, brethren, friends, that's false doctrine. There's a lot of things that are sexually immoral, but they are not fornication. There's a lot of things that are sexually immoral that are not fornication. If you have a wife that dances in a strip club, or that, or if you have a wife that dresses provocatively in front of people. You know, we're in the summertime. Some people like the summertime. Me, it's too hot. I like the fall. I like the, I, I like the early spring. I like the late fall. I like the cooler temperatures. But back in the early, back when I was growing up, a teenager, it was all about women wearing bras in public. Say what? 
Yeah, they would show the midriff and they would have shirts so high up they might as well just be wearing a bra in public. Today, it's all about the high pants, the shorty shorts. Some of them wear shorts so high up and then they wear these big old t-shirts and you wonder, are they wearing any pants at all? <coughs> that's sexually immoral. That's helping to incite lust. But that's not fornication. If, you're, if the version of the Bible you're reading says sexual immorality, then that essentially is saying that you can, divorce, you can divorce your wife for wearing short shorts in public. That's not what God's Word says. It says fornication. The Greek word there is pornea. Fornication. Guess what this eliminates? The New King James and the New American Standard. Let's go on to Matthew 5, 17. When Jesus said, don't think that I've come to destroy the law. Is it destroy or abolish? If your version reads abolish, you need to toss that junk out. You need to toss that translation out because guess what? That's Seventh-day Adventism right there. Saying that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He abolished the law when he nailed it to his cross. The Old Testament law has been done away with. It's been nailed to the cross. The Ten Commandments, the animal sacrifices, all of it. Brethren, when we're going... <coughs> what we're talking about in Leviticus is not law. We're talking about principles. We're talking about finding the same principles in the New Testament. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, but He came to fulfill it. And in fulfilling it, he abolished it. If your version says abolish, that's a strike against it. Guess what this does away with? When we just mentioned the NASB. And you said something this morning. Brother Matt, you said something this morning. You said you liked it when I say that it's immersion and not baptism. Because you talked, you said that it didn't that. Immersion is a burial. So many people think of, when they think of baptism, they think of being sprinkled or they think about being poured. Matthew 3.11, you can look it up. Does it say baptize with water or immerse in water? Brethren, I submit we need to start, we need to get away from using the term baptism. We need to start using the term immersion because when, when we get up and we talk about the plan of salvation, and we talk about hearing Romans 10, 17. We talk about believing Jesus is the I am, John 8, 24. When we talk about repentance of sins, Acts 17, 30. When we talk about making the, the, the uh, good confession publicly, Matthew 16, 16 and Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then we say you got to be baptized to the denominational world. They're thinking, oh, okay, I can come up and I can get a little bit of water sprinkled on me. That's not how the scripture defines it. Romans 6, 3, and 4, it's a burial. Immersion is a burial. It's a surrounding. It's an overwhelming. It's being whelmed. If your version says baptized with water, that's not correct. This is strikes against the KJV, the new KJV, and the new American Standard. The one of the four that gets it remotely right is the American Standard of 1901. It says baptize in water. Acts 12, 4, Easter or Passover. It's very interesting that of all the times that the Greek word for Passover is used, only one time in the King James does it say Easter. And even the King James only is, have to admit that this is a fault. Unless they're the real fanatical ones that say that the translation is directly inspired by God and that God inspired them to put Easter into it. And which at that point, if someone's arguing that, they've already gone so far off the deep end that they're not going to listen to anything that anybody has to say. Folks, really, this is a thing. This is a thing. If you don't believe me, you talk to some of them and they get upset over whether the word music has a K, the old spelling, or just a C at the end. If someone's that far off the deep end that they're going to get mad over music with a K at the end, 
versus music with the C at the end, they're not going to listen to anything remotely logical. But then we have one of the worst offender verses, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Faith or the faith. Brethren, I looked it up in the Greek. It says the faith. We are saved by the grace through the faith. And this the faith is the same the faith we read about in Jude 3. And it fits the context. It's the system of faith. Faith only denominationalists have misused a bad translation of this verse for ages now. This leaves us with really only one option left, and that's the MLB. It's not perfect. I'm not claiming it's perfect. No translation will be perfect. There's always improvements to be made. But we need to make sure our spiritual diet doesn't have poison in it. You eliminate the bad translations, you eliminate the poison, you also eliminate the wiggle room that the nominationalists use as footholds for their false doctrine. Now, lest anyone wonder, I don't get a kickback, I don't get paid for talking about this sort of stuff. I'm not looking for any favor with men. In fact, I've had people jump down my throat about this. I've had people blast me about this. I've had people ridicule me and hate me for talking about Bible translations. What's so strange about it is some of the ones that want to ridicule ridicule me about talking about Bible translations, they actually have lectureships. There was a lectureship a while back, the Power Lectureship. I, I don't remember what year I have the book. And it the whole thing of it was how we can understand the Bible alike. And there was a whole lecture, a whole sermon, a whole section, a whole chapter in that book devoted to, guess what? Bible translations. And yet the same ones that will devote a whole section, they want to say that it's foolish for me to get up and talk about it Sunday morning. Brethren, if you would be holy, your spiritual diet has to be pure. And the worship you have to offer to God has to be pure. God doesn't accept second-hand poisonous scraps. And He doesn't expect His people to accept the same thing either. This is because that son, the first day of the week, the lesson that is delivered... This is me offering to God the fruit of the lips. But if you remember, <clears throat> if you remember the priests, they got to eat from a portion from the sacrifices that was offered. When I, do, when I deliver the lesson Sunday morning, when I'm leading us in the sermon Sunday morning, I'm offering it up to God. But we also get to feast upon the word. If we would be holy, our spiritual diet has to be pure. Verse 26, you will not eat anything with the blood, neither will you use enchantments nor practice soothsaying. You will not round the corners of your heads, nor will you mar the corners of your beard. You will not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am Jehovah. Do not profane your daughters to make her, your daughter to make her prostitute, lest the land fall to prostitution and the land become full of wickedness. You will keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am Jehovah. Do not turn to those who have familiar spirits, nor to wizards. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am Jehovah your God. The previous points that we just looked at right quick, they are various religious and occult points in nature. And basically what God was saying if they wanted to be holy, they could not mimic the religious customs and nations around them. They weren't to look like them, verse 27, talking about rounding the corners of their head and marring the corners of their beard. They weren't to act like them, verses 26 and then 28 through 31. Now many try to go to verses 31 to condemn ghost hunting shows. Now first, if one does believe in anything like that, that would, if anyone believes in stuff like that, um, what would definitely be considered wrong would be anything occult. 
Ouija boards, seances, channeling, talking to witches and stuff like that, witchcraft, um, consulting the dead for wisdom. That that falls in line with horoscopes and whatnot like that. That's that that would be off. But uh, setting up cameras to capture motion, temperature reading, stuff like that, measuring scientific variables. Um, if one believes in stuff like that, more scientific in nature, depending on the motive, it could be considered sinful or not. Um, but if someone is walking around with a camera and they're like, ooh, I caught a ghost on camera. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't see necessarily how that would necessarily be sinful. But saying, oh, here's a Ouija board out here. Channel through me and tell me what you want us to know about the afterlife. That's, yeah, that would be sinful. Admittedly, there's a lot that we don't know about the afterlife. Anything that we do know comes from the Bible, comes from God's Word. Anything outside of it is just theory and conjecture. Speculation at best. But we don't want to get off. We don't want to miss the key point. That if we're, if we're going to be holy, we cannot act like the religious world around us. We can't buy into their false doctrines. We can't buy into their practices. If God was writing this to us today, He would be saying, don't have praise teams and mechanical instruments of music. Don't wear the long flowing robes or have your collars turned back. That would be essentially the point. He's saying don't act like the religious world that's in sin around you. How many so-called preachers will get up on a Sunday morning and they'll get up and they'll have these long robes and there'll be a praise team behind them and they're just up there clapping and, they're, and, and, he's, and he's preaching and he's preaching something. That, that, no, that's that's putting on a show. We don't need to act like that. Verse 32, you will rise up before the hoary head. That's H-O-A-R-Y. That means older or old. You will rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and you will fear your God. I am Jehovah. And if a stranger travels with you in your land, you will not do him wrong. The stranger that travels with you will be to you as the home born among you. And you will love him as yourself. For you were travelers in the land of Egypt. I am Jehovah your God. You will do no unrighteousness in judgment and measures of length, of weight, or of quantity. You will have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hen. I am Jehovah your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This last part, rounding things out, is that if one is going to be holy... They have to respect their elders and treat everyone equal. About respecting the elders, it doesn't mean that you have to obey them in all things blindly. There are some old people out there that are very foolish. Just look at the, the look at people in denominations. Now, does it mean that it it does mean that you respect people who are older than you? You respect their life experiences. You. You try to learn from them. They've had a lot of time to study things. They've had a lot of time to think on things. Try to learn from them. And elders, and, and the vice versa of this is you need to teach young people. Don't be the grouchy old neighbor that's mean to everyone and that's a hermit. Love the younger generation. Pass on what you know. Pass on what you've learned. Your mistakes. Your successes. The wording that best sums up this last part, and I know that we've gone over time, and I'm going to try to wrap this up as quickly as possible. If you want to, the uh, pat, if you want wording that best sums up this last part, if you would be holy, you must love your neighbor as yourself. Treat them as you would want to be treated. You don't want to be cheated out of your money, then don't cheat other people. You want to be respected, respect other people. What goes around comes around. Verse 37, you will observe all my statutes and all my ordinances and do them. I am Jehovah. 
If one is to be holy, there are timeless principles found in this chapter that we've gone over for three sermons in a row now in Leviticus 19. These principles, while these laws that God gave to the nation of Israel, we don't have to keep these laws. But the principles are timeless in their nature. If one wants to be holy, they have to follow certain principles. But above all else, if one is going to be holy, then they have to be a Christian. And the way to be a Christian, the way to start living a holy life, is to be born again. By believing that Jesus is the I Am, John 8.24. Repenting of sins, Acts 17.30. Making the good confession publicly, Matthew 16.16. 16, Romans 10.9-10. 10, and being immersed into Christ, into His death, Romans 6, 3 and 4. And to the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38, being born of water and of spirit, John 3.5. If you are a Christian but have not been walking in the light, 1 John 1.7, if you've not been living a holy life, then you can repent, you can ask for forgiveness, as Simon, once known as a sorcerer, did in Acts 8.22. If you have need to become a Christian or to come back home, we beg with you, we plead with you to do so, while the rest of us stand and as we sing. Yeah.